The video will cover the second part of the handout that we titled Zero Stuff. Uh, the beginning of the class, we went over the rules for factoring. And so last class, we were able to use a sum of cubes. So we were able to use this one. And we also used the difference of squares to uh, solve the, not just to solve, but yeah, to find the zeros of the problems that were on this handout, problems number one and two. which are here. One, that's a sum of cubes. This is a difference of squares. So you should have that on your notes already. Now for this one, we're going to factor it by grouping. If you count, how many terms do we have here, guys? One, two, three, four, five, six. And so right here under our rules, it says that we could use factoring by grouping if um, we have four or more terms. Why does it zero times a term if it's on the other side of the equals? Correct. Yes. So um, what I did here is I divided by group. So I took two terms at a time. That's what you can see on this row. And so factor by grouping, you take the factor, the common factor of each group. So for the first group, it was x to the fourth. Now for the second group, we took 9x out. And so if I factor 9x from here, I will get x squared. No, I'm sorry we must factor 9x squared out, right? Yes, because we have an x cubed and an x squared, so we take the x to the second power. Now, once I factor that out, I will get x minus 5. For my next and third group, what will be the common factor, guys? 14. 14. And so if we factor 14 there, we will get x minus 5. You could see that if you divide 70 by 14, you will get 5. Now, after here, what is the common factor that they all have? x minus 5. x minus 5, right? So that is going to be my GCF. x minus 5, because every single term has it. Now, my other factor is going to come. If it repeats, yes. We could factor it out. So it's similar to like if we had 2x squared plus 3x squared y plus 7x to the third, something like that. Let me just make a square. So if you had something like that, everything that has x squared, that will be considered the common factor or the GCF, the greatest common factor. In this case, the greatest common factor happens to be a binomial. So if, it, if, it, if they have it in common, yes, you could take it out, just like I would here. So just to finish that example, that will be a 2 plus 3y plus 7. And then we could probably add those. All right, going back to our example. If I factor out x minus 5 from here, I will get x to the 4. Next group, if I factor x minus 5 from there, I will get 9x squared. And if I factor x minus 5 from the third group, I will get plus 14. And that will equal 0. Now the trinomial, here we have a binomial, and here we have a trinomial, right? Three terms. So now I need to factor that one. And so what I'm going to do is use this rule to factor a general trinomial. I'm going to end up with two binomials multiplying. So we have here x minus 5, and this one will be the product of two binomials. So the first term for each binomial is going to be the square root of x to the fourth. What will that be? x squared, right? So we have x to the fourth, and we take the square root. That's the same as x to the fourth divided by 2, which is x squared. So that's what goes here and here. Now, um, our signs, if we look at this one, that tells me that both signs inside the binomials will be the same, right? Either both positive or both negative. However, this one is positive, so which combination do we go with? Positive. So both positive. 
All right, now factors of 14 of this number. 1 and 14, 2 and 7. Positive, all of them. So which one do we need? 2 and 7, because 2 and 7 add up to 9, and that's what we need. So 2 and 7. All right, now that we have all the factors equaling 0, we could use the zero factor property. And that would state that you could take each factor equal to zero and solve for x. Why do we do that? Because either one factor to equal to zero or two or all three. So the very first one all we got to do is take this negative 5 to the other side. The 5 is subtracting, so on the other side it will be adding. Now we turn it into positive 5. What type of 0 is that? Is that a real number? Yes. yes. Is it rational or irrational? Rational. rational because we could turn it into a fraction. The ratio of two integers. Now let's continue solving the other one. So we have x squared is equal to, we take this positive 2 across, and that will give us negative 2. So now we have to take the square root, and we will get x is equal to the square root of negative 1 times 2. So the square root of negative 1 will be i, and that 2 is, does not have an exact root, it is an irrational number, so we'll leave it inside the radical. But I have this thing, one thing here, plus minus. So from here, we're actually getting 2, right? 1 is x equals positive i square root of 2, and the other one is x equals negative i square root of 2. Let's solve the next one the same way. So x squared is equal to negative 7. Then we take the square root. So x will equal the square root of negative 1 times 7, which will be plus minus i square root of 7. And again, we get two zeros from here. One will be with a positive i square root of 7. And the other one will be negative i square root of 7. So let's count them all. How many do we have in total? One, two, three, four, and five. What is the degree of the polynomial? Five. That's the highest exponent, five. Does it make sense that we have five zeros? Yes, it does. Now, how do we call the zeros right here, Luis, down here? Imaginary. Imaginary. Very good. Could we say that they're rational or irrational? Well, actually, that was a trick question. None. They're just imaginary. That's it. <laughs> because the only ones that, remember, it's complex, and then real, imaginary, and then real divides, divides in rational or irrational. All right? Okay, so now you are going to turn to your partner who is sitting behind or in front of you. And you are going to solve problem number four all alone. You will not die. And uh, it's very similar to, the, to problem four, okay? After that, we're going to do... I need to get you guys uh, sign up for an account. So we're going to be using your laptop. So do me a favor and just turn on your laptop right now because you guys know it takes forever. Yeah, let's get you one. So this is a solution to problem four. We solve it the same way as problem three. Let me record. So we factor by grouping. We made three groups. After that, we ended up with the common factor being x plus 5, so that is this binomial. The trinomial came from here, the numbers in orange. 
So we ended up with three factors, and after equaling each factor to zero, we found all five zeros. We have this one here, which happens to be real. And is it rational or irrational, guys? Can we turn it into a fraction? Yeah. So rational. And here we have two imaginary. And right here we have another two imaginary. So that gives me a total of five. Um, so I want to show you guys something quickly since we have here and we're talking about imaginary zeros. So if you look at your notes, maybe towards the end, there's a theorem called complex conjugate theorem. Let's just get it out of the way. And so what this one states is that if you have a zero, that is an imaginary number, such as that one, then you will assume right away that the complex conjugate is also a zero, all right? So if I tell you in a problem like the example here, if three plus four i is a zero, meaning x equals three plus four i, then by the complex conjugate theorem, the complex conjugate of it is also a zero. And the complex conjugate, in case you forgot, it has the exact same real and imaginary parts, but the sign of the imaginary is the opposite. Right? That's, those are complex conjugates. So I'm going to pause the video, and now I want you guys to register for an online account. Now let's, re let's reveal a little bit of the notes that you guys copy from the PDF file. So... It was about it's the second slide. You can see here we have the remainder theorem. And so you already know what the remainder theorem is. Let me give you an example. If I ask you, find the polynomial value or the function value at x equals 4, if that was the question, uh, you guys know that you can get that with synthetic division, right? So you divide. And whatever you get here for the remainder, let's say you get the remainder is 7. So by the remainder theorem, what that means is that p of 4, or the function value at x equals 4, is 7. Right? Do you guys remember doing that? All right. Now, right here, we have a defi de uh, definition. One thing that I think we should add is that this here is actually called the division algorithm. And someone asked me earlier, what's an algorithm? So an algorithm is kind of like a plan, a series of steps that you make to solve a problem. Computer scientists do that all the time. So it could be like a recipe to make a cake. That's like an algorithm. All right, so let me show you an example with numbers first, because we love numbers. Let's say if we have 37 divided by 5, we know that we could break that fraction into 35 fifths, right? And then two fifths. So in mixed, as a mixed fraction, you are very used to writing it this way. 35 over 5 is 7. So that means that 37 could be divided by 5 seven times. And then we have two fifths, right? Left? So remember, you used to do that in elementary? Maybe in middle school? I don't like that, but we use that plus in between, and it's all good. Now, by the division algorithm, we can write this number, 37 fifths, as the following. So the dividend is 37, right here. And that is equal to the quotient, which is 7, times the divisor, which is 5, plus the remainder. What is the remainder? 2. So let me write it down. Let me write the names of each part. So this is the dividend. 
to 7 right here is the quotient. The 5 here is the divisor. And the 7 is the remainder. And that is the exact same thing that you guys have written here. Okay? So if we look at a polynomial, let's say we have this polynomial of second degree, and it's being divided by x plus 10. So this right here is the divisor. So the idea is that if you multiply the divisor by the quotient, and you add the remainder, then you will get the original polynomial. Okay, that is the division algorithm. Um, now, here you could see, again, the remainder theorem, so that's the same thing that we already learned from previous weeks. Now, we have here a concept called the factor theorem, and that is another theorem that says that if you have a factor and the remainder happens to be zero, if your divisor, after you perform division, you get a remainder of zero, then you could say that the divisor is a factor of the polynomial. Let's add that here. So the divisor is a factor of the polynomial. And that only happens if the remainder is zero. And I think I mentioned that. All right, next slide. We have here the definition of a polynomial. I don't want you to be scared, okay? Because we have several letters here. So let's establish what each letter represents. We have letter N. What does N represent? The, the highest exponent? The degree. What about a sub n? This one right here. The leading coefficient. Please write, add this to your notes. You should be writing this on your notes. So highlight it. So that is your leading coefficient. Remember when I told you uh, when you were in elementary and then they used to put you on front of the line and you were the leader of the line and you used to feel all special? Like you control the class, right? Alexis, you used to be the leader of the line all the time. Make sure my son is the leader of the line a lot. So he doesn't bother the other kids. <laughs> He's also the PE star. All right. What about the last one? What would you guys think that A sub zero would be? Someone told me the caboose. <laughs> Did I get it? The last one? Uh, Not the remainder. We're talking about polynomials. So let's say we have a polynomial of degree 4. So this will be the term of degree 4. And then we'll have degree 3, degree 2, degree 1. So the last one will be degree 0. And if it is degree 0, how do we call it? Constant, yes. In other words, it's just a number. The C part, right? The C part, yes, correct. So here they're calling it C, the constant. All right. Now, when we're referring to equations, those no, those x values that will be the the solutions, like the problems we've been doing here on this handout, those are called roots or solutions. If we're talking about equations, that will be called roots or solutions. If we are talking about a function, we will call them zeros. And if they're real, we could see them as x-intercepts, like we have here, right? Those are real zeros. How do I know they're real? Because they are visible, right? We see them on the x-axis. Uh, what else can I tell you guys about this? All right. And so if this is a factor, we know that because right here it's telling us that C is a zero. So I go back, it goes back to this. Let me give you an example. If we have a factor such as 
x minus 3. How do we find the 0? We take the factor, we equal it to 0, and then we solve for x. So that will give me x is positive 3. So that means that my 0 will be 3. So that is what they're telling us here. If we have a 0, we can go back from the factor or the other way around. It's like a circle. TSI. They're going to ask you the same question over and over and over, but sometimes they will use the word zero, sometimes they will use the word root, other times solution. Or sometimes they might give you a polynomial and ask you, find the zeros, or find the x-intercepts, or find the roots, or find the factors. Okay? Other times they might give you the zeros, and tell you, find the equation of the polynomial. We do that a lot. So next week, we're going to focus on that, how to go from zeros to the equation. All right? But right now, we have like about four minutes. And Friday, we're going to keep going on that, like how to find zeros. All right? OK, we have here below the fundamental theorem of algebra. And so that one, it says, that every polynomial, as long as the degree is greater than zero, give me a degree greater than zero, Max uh, one. one, yeah. So starting with degree one, they will have at least one complex root. Well, let me give you an example. Give me, Jasmine, give me a polynomial of degree one. Okay, x plus 6. Will that one cross the x-axis then? Yes, it will. So we'll have one root, right? What if it's like 1 equals 1 and 2 is whatever? Y equals something? 1 or something. No, that's 2. That's it. Oh, well that one will be of degree 0, so it doesn't have to have a root. Um, in fact, that one will not touch the x-axis. It will just be here, a constant function. Now, let's think of something of degree 2. What type of graph would that be, guys? Parabola. Parabola. What will that 4 do to it? It will make it go up, down, left, right. It will make it go up. Up, up, up. It's a vertical shift because it's not affecting the x directly. So it's going to be right here. Is that going to have real zeros? What is it going to have? Imaginary. Imaginary. So let's see if I can find them. I equal that to zero, and then we could use the same thing we were using before, right? We take the square root of that. And what is the square root of negative 4? 2i. But we consider positive and negative. Now, does that contradict the fundamental theorem of algebra? No. Because complex are real or imaginary. Okay, so the theorems are not theorems. No, the theorems are real. Yes, you don't argue. So they're real. Once they become a theorem, that's because they're real and they have been proven by mathematicians who don't have a lot. <laughs> okay? So, is that true? No, sir, Becky. I didn't see it attack. So, do we have complex zeros there? Yes, even though they're imaginary, they're still complex. All right. And quickly, quickly, hmm, we'll probably stop here because I don't want to rush, rush through this, but this means that we have to cover a little more on Friday, okay? All right. So, this will be the end of the video. Could you guys please remind me that I stopped here, okay? Right there. Actually, yeah, we need that for the homework for sure. Huh? That's the white boy lost. Oh, yeah. If you want to talk about that. Back in the day, like the smart guys used to be smart and smart, right? Like Leonardo da Vinci, like scientists and artists.